Hi, I'm Alex Howard, and welcome to Conscious 2. My guest in the studio today is Sam Winston. Hi, Sam. Hi, Alex. And in today's interview, we are going to be exploring where art meets the noise and complexity of daily life. And Sam is a multidisciplinary artist who works with drawing, sculpture, and is also a poet and a published author. So... Sam, maybe as a starting point, let's maybe just touch a little bit on your own journey with art. So how do you become an artist? Like, how, how, how did it, it start for you? Um, I think it, initially, it's, it, for me, it started with a problem, which was uh, quite early on in my education. Uh, dyslexia really got in the way with my learning style. Uh, and uh, thankfully, my parents put me on to or decided to make a decision about where I was schooled, and that was at the Wardorf School. So from about the age of 10 uh, through, through four or five years, I was at Steiner, and that really um, incubated this sense of creative practice and maybe something that was less linear in, it, in, it, in its format. And then that led into art school. And then from art school, uh, I left with this idea that, you know, I make things and I write and I draw and... And then the next 13 years have been a, a journey with that. And um, part of that has come out in books. So part of that is poetry and writing. But I'm just as happy to take the visual of the letter form and turning it into a drawing or a picture, or, and that's galleries. And wh where things are at the moment is, I would say that uh, some of it is published books. Some of it is uh, working with the institutes like the South Bank and the Victoria and Albert Museum and doing either commissions or exhibitions or even participatory work and some of it is in say the contemporary art market mm. so they're the three fields that i'm working in at present yes and of course i'm also aware that you've had a background in i don't know if you call it dharma or kind of meditation or but that's also informed your work quite a lot yeah and i think this might come up in our conversation is that uh at a certain point um as a creative and you're saying what do i say next what do i say next there's a certain point where you go don't say anything next and that and that wasn't I wasn't finding that in the cultural climate or I wasn't finding the level of depth in that cultural climate in say just modern just the the modern western culture so that led me into body work with yoga and then that led me into um, many different strands of meditation um, mm. which has been an ongoing thing for maybe five years in so ten years I've been yes. having a, a, a spiritual practice yeah. yes okay and something that um actually maybe what we should do is just give people a bit of a taste of the work, the work that you do and, and i don't know if you wanted to say a little bit of context about the video sure. we're, we're about to show um the type of work that i'm doing is always process-led so i'm always having an inquiry uh, and sometimes the inquiry is silent which is meditative and there isn't an output this one is just on the edge of silence i would mm. say um and it's a project in which i'm using my body as a tool and using some ideas around mapping. So I'm mapping exhalations of my breath with a, with a single line. And then, uh, as you'll see in the video, there's um, what comes out is basically a map of maybe breathing, but hopefully it leads you to something yeah, a bit bigger than just breathing. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we'll show that video now. Great.
So it's pretty amazing as a as a piece of work. And I, I'm also aware that it was 15 hours that mm. you continued this for. I, I'm wondering what it was like for you, that practice, 15 hours, a very simple practice, but I guess also somewhat focused in a sense in mm. terms of, of, of what you were doing. Yeah, what was I, it like? I, I, a, a lot of the work does seem to be... Um, it has this long durational element and uh, a lot of people, some people resonate with, wow, you must have discipline to do that. And, and my, my personal feeling is it's almost the opposite. Um, it has to be so soft at the beginning. It has to be so gentle. It has to be like, if you're going to do something for 15 hours and you're not going to have a break, you've got to be like in love with it and you've got to have a sense of play and you've got to be like wow and it's the it's the act of staying with the absorption uh and that needs a sense of humor and it needs a lightness of touch not an intensity yes uh so yeah yeah and also it kind of raises for me a really interesting question around i think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions or a lot of ideas of what is art and what isn't art and i think even more specifically that they're not artistic and other people are artistic sure. so i don't know if there's anything you could say around you know either what is art or, or what is artistic expression even it's, um, it's, yeah i i, I hap- happily massive it's a massive question but i um for me right now what's what i would understand art to be is it's a term in which we uh we put creativity into our culture so um i would broadly give it two distinctions there's the fine arts and there's the applied arts um and the fine arts are pure but still we have to put a frame around it we have to put it into a theater space we have to put a we have to put some cultural context to say this is what you do, this is the audience, this is the participant. And then often fine artists are always trying to challenge that by taking the painting out of the, you know, painting becomes performance and this whole mm. thing. And then there's the applied arts, which is um, literally the clothes we're wearing is, is fashion, the room we're in is architecture, the streets we walk down is again architecture, the music we listen to on the radio, obviously that's, um, that's music. And so all of that is applied and also uh it, the the thing for me that i've noticed is that as as a as a culture we're very much into the consumption of mm. uh the arts and uh consumption's great but generally i think that balance between consumption and creation it, it needs to be addressed at some point and like you said we're in this situation where uh, a lot of people go well i don't i don't do the arts but uh, Which is kind of what I said to you when you arrived. Yeah, I was yeah, like, like it, I, I like art, I really appreciate it, but I'm not. I'm, 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 not, an I'm artist. not an artist. Yeah. And, I, and I think part of that, I think part of the part of the work of um, of kind of exploring creativity, rather than just appreciating it and being inspired by it, is the homework of seeing where you embody that yes. and fostering that. So it, it can be in in cooking a meal and taking that a little bit further, or it can be. The way that I often think about it is the term, what's your flow activity? So in sp- everything has to have creativity, creation. Bringing up children is an act of creation. So I know that's an incredibly broad mm. term for artistic practice, but when I'm around children and I'm like, you're having this episode, I'm not, you have to be creative about how to re get them out of that space. I'm, I have two small children. <laughs> I'm very aware of this fact. I get it. Yeah, and, and, that, and that also, that also that's theatre. Yeah. But people wouldn't have that context. They'd be like, no, it's got to be in this. So one of the problems of having official spaces, it separates the audience from the creative. Yes. And as a practitioner that steps in between these, you know, how I get to work and how I interact with people will be the food for when it goes official in a participatory piece. But that's no, and that's yes, this is art, mm. this isn't. So I, I think one of the pra- a good practice is to identify where you're in flow and when you, when, when you are basically um, just really absorbed and loving the thing that you're doing. Yeah. And I would say that's all. I really like that. And I, you know, I, I, can, I can think in um, you know, my own life that, for example, in my, in my business life and in my mm. you know, kind of um, creating of strategy and ideas. And for me, that's the thing that just flows and, and, and kind of comes alive. And it does feel artistic, but it, I would 
without this kind of definition, I'd feel totally fraudulent to call it art. But I actually hear what you're saying, that mm. actually it's a place where something comes alive. And I guess with that kind of broader definition, it, it then raises another question of what, what supports that flow? Because, mm. you know, f- for some people that appears effortless to the outside, sure. <laughs> I'm not sure it necessarily is. Sure. But like, you know, what, maybe one way to come in is like, what, what's your experience of, of creativity? Like what supports you in, mm. in letting that flow happen? I think we touched on this and and within when when teaching uh, uh, in a teaching environment, you find it very it's quite mysterious in one way because you're just like, how did this student get to this this piece and how did someone else not? Mm. And um, I guess for art students, one of the most stable things is actually uh, is actually developing a sense of trust. Mm. And w- and then it, it, forget forget oh, forget, where does trust come from? I mean, one of the one of the the really most kind of ridiculous examples I give is brushing your teeth. You trust that you're going to have clean teeth at the end of the day, and it's not a, it's not going to be a big freak out, you know. <laughs> and the reason that trust has developed is because you do it regularly, and yeah. there's that familiar familiarity. So some of the best practitioners and practitioners I know, they can stand up in front of thousands, or they can know that this piece is going to be worth vast amounts of money, and they'll have ink, and it'll just be sh- 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 like that, and mm-hmm. it's like. Wow, there was so much pressure and so much performance anxiety, yet you were still able to go to an essence. And that essence isn't within that moment. That essence is that your body knows what it's doing, your, uh, your intuition knows what it's doing, and the trust has come from just having a very, very regular, habitual relationship with doing the thing, like brushing your teeth. Uh, it's really interesting what you're saying because I think a lot of people's perception of creativity is that it either it, it flows and it's there mm. or it isn't. Mm. And, I've, and I've, I've heard a, a few different people that, that are artists say this. Actually, there's something about that being diligent in, in practice. Mm. I think that surprises people sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's very much to do like the if you're going to do a piece and it's 15 hours or something like that, there's a softness, there's a playfulness, there's a sense of humor. And then there's, there's that diligence. And, and that's what's interesting about a craft process is craft is a learned skill. But you can get stuck in craft because then you go, I'm a potter. And you've given yourself this parameter again where you can't be a dancer because you're a potter, right? So it's like that there's, a, there's a very fine balance of learning the craft, the repetition of it so you're confident within it. And then from that confidence, you can kind of let it bounce places as well. So it, it, there is a bit of a dance that happens within that. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> it, it, it's... It, it kind of part of what fascinates me about it is that I think there are so many misconceptions, and I include myself in this, misconceptions mm. that we can have around what is that artistic process. And one of the things, you sent me a, an article when I was kind of preparing for this interview, mm. and you said something in that, that I really liked, and I, I'm probably going to slightly butcher it here, but what you were roughly saying was that art is a way of resolving our own inner disharmony. Mm. I don't know if you can kind of say that because I, I really like that sense that rather than art being this pure kind of expression that actually we can have this sense that we feel kind mm. of messy and disharmonious inside and actually creativity can be a way of working with that. Yeah, I, I, I would, my, my lived experience of creativity is it's neutral. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's a force which is able to do, which is able to create, but it's not for the good or for the bad. And I've got my own relationship with the creative act, but it's, it's where, firstly, it's where the fire is. So yes. you can tell a project's going to last and you're going to do it because there's fire there. So it's an alive question that has a fire which kind of says, okay, and it brings you back to the question and it brings you back and you go, that's rubbish and you go away and then you come back and you do another format and you're rubbish. So firstly, there's the fire and that fire doesn't have to be like you said, it doesn't have to be like pure and light, <laughs> and, you know, it can be a very real fire and that's, that's like on the edge of this destructive element, which is, which, which, um, you know, any artist will tell you to make a poem, you're destroying the white space of the page. To put a picture in an environment, you're destroying the visual harmony of nothing. So Mm. the act of creation is always at the cost of something else. Um, And there's this amazing, I remember, and this goes back to the the dyslexia thing, um, 
where I found this statistic where the students on the MA at the Royal College of Art, which, you know, is a prestigious MA and uh, it's a good college, um, on the communications course, there was something astonishingly 60-70% were dyslexic. Is that right? So wow. that, that's like, there's fire there. I can't, I can't work out the traditional language formats. I'm working out visual formats. Yeah, that statistic is also, it was almost, at the time when I read it, it was almost identical to the amount of people that were young offenders that were dyslexic in high-risk huh. sort of like homes and areas like that. So that, that to me is not a coincidence. That's very, there's, there's something very interesting going on there. And, and again, I'm going back to the container. One container is a cell. Another container is a gallery space. And even though that might seem like a tenuous link, um, the fire and the spontaneity working with high-risk kids and that explosiveness, right? You have to have a very calm container, mm. but what comes out is raw, it's alive, it's magical, and it's everything that you're thinking, this, should be, this is art, mm. you know? And you're like, you can feel it, you can, it's palatable, the energy. And, and this, is it, I'm just kind of working out in, in my own mind that there's something around, if we're totally overtaken emotionally, that right. I imagine yeah, what comes yeah. out artistically is kind of doesn't work. Mm. And is there a place of kind of allowing that feeling and allowing ourselves to be kind of taken by it, mm. but also staying present somehow? Mm. And kind of, is there anything you can say about how to work with that kind of creative flow? Yeah, because once creative is at full volume, it's, it's an explosion, right? Yeah. So it's destructive. Um, and that, again, goes back to... So with third-year design students or art students, and they're having this freak-out. They're like, how am I going to exist in the world? I don't know what my identity is. And they're in that place of emotional overflow. That's when they know whether the last three years they had learned to feed themselves three times a day, they had learned to go to bed at the right time. And I'm, ki I'm not kidding, it's like what makes a good designer is three meals and a, a practice in which they can sleep regularly. <laughs> I know that sounds really boring. I really, really, like, boring, like, I re I really just, get it. It's that, I really it's that, get it. It's that, it's that, again, it's the habit. It's like I'm not in control anymore, but the... I've been brushing my teeth, I've been going, I've been looking after my body. It's that habitual element that will hold you. Yeah. So you can kind of like that, whatever the explosion needs to happen, but there's a trust there. I really like that. And I guess that when there's not that holding in place, that's where people, you kind of see the kind of tortured artist where sure. someone is not grounded in, in the creativity mm. in terms of, of, of what they're doing. Yeah. And that tortured thing is very interesting because I think, I think, um, at a certain stage in an artist's career, it becomes, you realize that you're not a single unit. Mm. You realize that whatever cultural modes in place shape who you are. Do I make art fair art that sells in art fairs? Do I make um, public funded art? Which, and that shapes the type of work that you get. And then you realize that so you're a lot more amorphous. And if the culture's sick, then the artist can get sick. Mm. And, that, and that's, I, there's, a, there's a fantastic quote around, and I can't remember, it verbantum, but basically, if you want to, if you want to kill an artist, give them a lot of money. Huh. And I'm not saying I'm not. I'm definitely not saying the poor artist is a great model because mm -hmm. that's that's equally that's not recognizing it. But um, it becomes incredibly hard because uh, then you're being given a, a whole load of energy, and it's like. And I found I found that I've had to go back to the regular when when large commissions or mm. large sales of work come in. I have to go back to brushing the teeth, three square meals, get in at this time, finish at this time. And that doesn't work for everyone. But it's that, it's that habitual pattern that will hold me whilst what's going on inside is like close to a fireworks display because yeah. you're like this and this and this. I think that, 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 and I think, you know, going back to this definition of art being much broader than traditional, what we'd conceive of art, mm. I think that's true in life as well. And I, I think it's, it seems to me the more creative, some, the more kind of naturally burning somebody is, actually the more important, as you were saying, the more yeah. important that becomes. Yeah. I also, I wanted to touch on um, the role of silence in creativity, especially knowing that, that you've had, you know, 10 years of kind of practice of meditation mm. in, different, in different forms. How, about, how has that informed you artistically and, and, and your, your life kind of more broadly than that as well? Yeah. Um, I think in about 2002 or 2003, I was doing a project around the dictionary. I liked it as an object. Um, it's quite an interesting thing. And uh, I went to Oxford University Press and the lady gave me this tour around the whole of the 
um, the press, and she said, and this is the room that we have all the words that aren't in the dictionary in. So the whole room? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it's, just, and, and it's like a bit Indiana Jones moment with all these little things and brrr, and then all little cards, and I'm sure, and these are the words that aren't in the dictionary. Huh. And that, for me, is a really kind of interesting metaphor for we often operate in these two spheres. We operate in the world of language, thought, concept, talking, quite solid, quite real. Or, if you have a spiritual practice, you operate in the, you can't say it, it's inexpressible, it's too profound, it's non-dual, it's whole. Mm. Yeah? And these two spheres seem to be, they have a bit of conflict. You know? That's mm -hmm. definitely like, mm -hmm. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of friction in that. And for me, that room is a place which is a great example of saying there's a shoreline between what is said and what isn't said. And I would extend that metaphor of the shoreline that a drawing operates in that space. It's not in the space of language which is solid. It's not in the space of concept, yet it's not in the space of silence. And this shoreline is what creativity is great at because everything comes from, ultimately it comes from that gra the pregnant void or the ground of, of that. And then it goes into not the form, but this weird, I would say, bardo state of in-between, mm -hmm. and then it would manifest into something solid when it's in the person or the culture. So that, my journey has been, um, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can play here in the form, and you can play in the shoreline a lot. And one of the most satisfying things for me is inviting viewers into a shoreline, and hopefully, usually it's from concept to the shoreline, and then you get to the shore, and some people just f jump into the sea. Yeah. And then there's a, a look of, yeah, I can't really go there with concept and language anymore, right. but it's still something that's shared. And you're like, mm, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the role of art. Yeah, and, and I'm wondering as well if, uh, you know, we were talking about the kind of eating three meals, sleeping, has, has meditation just in a very practical level yeah supported you in, in yeah um, initially it does initially it does but then also by deep listening what comes up is big things so then, <laughs> that's right and then and then yeah. the uh, destabilizes after yeah, a while yeah, yeah yeah but and then that's where the creative practice comes yeah. in because that takes it back so it's like it, you you're having little little um couriers take you from one zone yes. into that space and then they'll take you back again and when you're in this deep space of um like some of when very big moments happened in my practice when I became very small as a thing. Mm. More than very small, yeah? Uh, and then from that, the language of art, which is the unconscious language, led me back into this world and then back and forth. So they're yeah. both gifts. Yes. They're both gifts. Yeah. yeah. Great. We've we got a couple of minutes left. I was curious to maybe end with, what's burning inside of you right now? Like what, what, what are you working on or what are you, what are you looking to work on? Wasn't a planned question this, but yeah, no, I, I, I like I, it. I, I like it. Curious. Well, what is very exciting for me now, and this is kind of interesting is I was talking to, so one of the strange habits I've got is some of the work that I sell, not all of it, but some of the work I sell, I put cadets on it and I say, if you buy this, I'm going to use the money to um, explore reconciliation work. And then if they sell it, they have to use the money to export, explore reconciliation work. So for me, that's one way of battling the idea of um, commodifying an object. Is like, yeah, I want you to appreciate it financially, but the money that comes from it, you'll never see it as a, as a stock folio, or any, you wouldn't be able to own it as an object. So that, that I did with a piece called Solace, and that led me into this space. Um, uh, uh, a Zen master called Bernie Glassman does a retreat in Auschwitz, and this is a much longer story. Um, but the space of Auschwitz is a, is a real space of conflict mm. and great trauma. And, uh, uh, and I can't really fully talk about that retreat, but some of the things that come out of that, for me, is on the journey back. It's like, right, we were in the children's ward of this space, and this is a, a very upsetting experience, and you're there. And then maybe two years later, I'm working with a, a children's book author and we're doing a book and we're doing a book um, with a publisher in the US and the UK. And the children's book author was like, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write for this kid that I don't know. He's called Hugh Brick and he was born in Auschwitz mm -hmm. and he had the smallest of glimpses of life and it was 
blown out very early on, two year, uh, year, like months after leaving Birkenau, and let's do that. And somehow the energy and the kind of will that you're talking about fire, both me and Oliver have just really taken to that. And we're mm. like, and obviously it's not going to be as traumatic and as intense mm. as that experience. It's going to be full of joy. It's, it's joyful. And it's exactly what you said at the beginning of this talk, which was like, how can you use creativity as a way to kind of deal with this world and this kind of like this space. And the book is for kids to give them a space in which they can be, they can, a safe space, which mm. is a creative space. So that's, that's what's alive for me at the moment. And that's kind of a good intersection of, you know, this incredibly hard place and something quite light yeah. coming out of it. It's mysterious. Yeah, that's very beautiful, mm. very beautiful. Well, look, I wish we had more time, but Sam, thank you. It's been, it's, I've really enjoyed that. It's been okay. a great discussion, so thank you. Yeah. And thank you for watching, and we look forward to talking with you again here on Conscious 2, hopefully very soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.